We must now move to questions to the Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development. We will start with listed questions, and I call Mr. Stephen Mutray. Question number one, Principal Deputy Speaker. If farmed animals are properly identified, their keepers can normally be identified from data held in the Department's customer and animal information databases. The Department will share this information according to DARD's privacy notice and in line with data protection legislation. The Department assists the PSNI to trace the owners of farmed animals found abandoned on a public highway. And if abandoned animals are not properly identified, it is often impossible to establish who is responsible for them. Call Mr. Mutri for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the uh, Minister for her answer. But I'm going to press her further and ask her: uh, Can the Minister clarify who is responsible for abandoned horses on private land when uh, animal welfare is not the issue? In relation to horses, councils and the animal enforcement officers are very clearly in the lead in terms of being able to go out and try and identify the owners. The department will work with. Um, not just in relation to horses, but in relation to all animals, will work with either the PSNI or councils, depending on the circumstances. But principally for horses, it's the council responsibility. Well, Mr. Pat Sheehan. I'm a lot of free loss, Concorda. And just to expand on that point, could the minister tell us what uh, what the legal position is on abandoning animals? Well, it's illegal for cattle, for sheep, or pigs to be sold or moved off a farm unless that they're um, properly identified. And if the identity of the bovine animals cannot be established within 48 hours, then the department will seize and destroy them without delay under the provisions of the cattle identification regulations. And my department does not have the power to, to, to um, detain or destroy unidentified pigs and sheep, but it does have the power to prohibit their movement. Well, Ms. Kef Karen uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, is there any links uh, for abandoned animals uh, and uh, understanding with the like of the USPCA to make the role uh, and the protection of the animal uh, more fluent uh, in finding ownerships? I don't, I'm not necessarily so sure if there's a role for USPCA in that instance, but um, certainly there's a role for partners to work together to be able to identify owners, to be able to hold people to account, particularly in cases of animal cruelty or animal abandonment. In relation to horses in particular, councils, as I said, are very strong in the lead. In relation to farmed animals, obviously it's the department's role. But then in relation to criminality and other aspects, then the PSNI obviously take control. So I think there is always a grey area in, in, in fairness, and particularly in relation to horses in areas where there's high, high numbers of horses. But certainly councils are in the lead and in conjunction with the PSNI then try to identify owners. And the department, when it comes to farmed animals, the department will um, certainly use whatever systems we have and within the limits of data protection try to identify owners and work with all of the stakeholders. Call Mrs Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Minister give an assessment of the scale of the problem of abandoned horses across Northern Ireland and provide an update on the consideration within her department uh, of the redefinition of a horse from a, uh, from a domestic to a farm animal, which would uh, greatly enhance the, the welfare of abandoned horses? I know the member has a keen interest, in particularly in relation to um, horses and, and a previously um, tabled a bill in relation to the definition of a horse. And I've had numerous conversations with um, the equine industry in, in relation to where or not we should change designation. I wasn't convinced of the merits of doing so at that moment in time, but I'm always open to um, considering it further if there ever was a change or new arguments to be, um, there to be put forward on the table for consideration. But certainly at this moment in time, I'm not convinced of the need to change the definition. In terms of the problem of horses, it's a council issue and councils take the lead, so councils would be better to give you an assessment in terms of um, particular problems. I think it's fair to say that some areas have um, more of a problem than others. Uh, it's not something that's coming to me or being tabled with me as a, a key area of concern, although um, having dealt with the issue in my own constituency on, on numerous occasions, I do understand it's frustrating for um, people who constantly um, encounter abandoned horses on the roads, maybe um, car, car accidents as a, as a result of um, horses being wild and on the roads. So I think it's um, very important that we're very clear about who's responsible for what, and that's certainly um, what we try to do. I encourage anybody with concerns in relation to horses to talk to their council, council animal enforcement officers. I call Mr Declan McAleer. Question two. I have been concerned about the impact of the new EU country of origin labelling rules on the trade of sheep reared in the north and slaughtered in the south. I'm doing everything in my power to support solutions to the current situation and to head off any potential problems for other products in the future. I have been in regular contact with Minister Coveney in the south and his department on labelling issues that affect issues right across the island and in order to seek a resolution to the specific issues in the sheep sector. 
My officials have had a constructive meeting with the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine officials recently, and they've also met with EU Commission officials in Brussels on the matter, as well as DEFRA officials and the Food Standards Agency officials here in the north. I've also discussed the impact of country of origin labelling with Commissioner Hogan during his recent visit, and I've written to DEFRA Secretary of State and to the EU Commission outlining the, the unique circumstances of agri-food businesses in this island, and I'm making the case for greater flexibility in labelling our local products. Elizabeth Truss, the DEFRA Minister, has replied positively to my letter, and I'm pleased that she has offered her support in finding a solution to the problem. I'm still awaiting a reply from the EU Commissioner. Ahead of today's meeting in the Agriculture and Fisheries Council in Luxembourg, at which labelling is likely to be raised during any other business, I have contacted the English, Scottish and Welsh counterparts to reiterate my view that we need flexibilities for farmers in the north, and I remain fu fully committed to finding a solution to labelling difficulties that works for everyone and will continue to press for flexibility for our local products. Mr McAleer for his supplementary. Uh, I would thanks, uh, thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister outline what impact the country of origin labelling has had on any other sectors? Thank you. Yes, I mean, since it's come into play, um, last year we had the issue of the so-called nomadic um, cattle and the whole issue that was caused around the labelling of, of the meat and, and the beef trade was um, quite significantly affected in 2014. I think that the voluntary term Irish could be used to label beef derived from cattle born in the south and imported into the north or either for direct slaughter or for finishing and slaughter. I'm aware that the recent Commission report on the feasibility of extending country of origin labelling to other products, including milk. I understand that the reports have concluded that the cost of extending voluntary country of origin labelling to additional food products, including milk and milk products, would outweigh the benefits to consumers, but voluntary labels should be allowed. Given the negative effect on beef and lamb, I would not support a further extension of country of origin labelling to other products, such as milk. Potential exists for very damaging effect on our milk industry. We currently send about 23% of our milk to the 26 counties for processing. So I'm going to continue to press for maximum flexibility in labelling for our products, because this is going to have an impact on all other sectors, not just the beef and lamb that's been affected to date. Well, Mr. Robin Swan. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Minister, there is a perception among farmers that there's processors actually taking advantage of this to lower prices for lambs across the border. Can the Minister do anything to delay these suspicions, or has she met processors to discuss and raise those concerns? I think there's always going to be concerns from, pro, um, from farmers, particularly in relation to market um, volatility around pricing and about controls that are used by processors and others and the retailers, those that buy their product. Um, that's an ongoing um, concern of mine. It's something that I would have raised with the Agri-Food Strategy Board. It's something that I want to um, work and bring forward initiative um, over the next number of months, particularly in relation to the whole supply chain and how we can work together. One of my strong um, signals and messages to the Agri-Food Strategy Board when it was established was that we need fairness in the supply chain, that there's a need for clear and um, full communication with the industry from the farmer right through um, to when the product's on the shelf in a supermarket. And unless we have that, we're damaging our agri-food sector and we're um, potentially causing problems down the future for, for the industry. So for me, it's a priority. It's an issue that I continually raise with the Agri-Food Strategy Board. It's an issue that I continue to raise with NIMEA and the other processor um, organisations when I meet with them. I think that um, for me in moving forward, particularly in relation to the lamb issue at the minute, where we've seen prices drop so significantly, then there's the other impact of their market forces. There's been supply and demand. Um, for instance, or even the, the euro rate. They have all um, compounded a problem. But I think we need to remove any barriers that are there from an EU level. So if that's the country of origin labelling, if we have a voluntary label, then no, processors can't use it as a stick to beat farmers. Call Mr William Irwin. Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, I welcome the fact that the Minister has made efforts uh, in regard to resolving the labelling saga. Uh, does the Minister feel that we only need a resolution on this? Well, in terms of approaching Europe, I mean, there, there is provision for a voluntary label, um, and I have made all the right approaches. We have had positive feedback from DEFRA in England, so I, I very much welcome that, and I raised it with um, George Eustace, the DEFRA um, Under Minister, which I spoke to last night. Um, we have ongoing discussions with Minister Covey in the South, because obviously we need um, agreement from the three parties to be able to um, take the voluntary label forward. So yes, I do think that we're making significant progress, and the sooner we can get to that point, the better. This is, not, this is only one of a number of issues that obviously affects the industry, but we need to remove any barriers or, there or any obstacles that are there um, in terms of trade. There's a traditional trade across this island, whether it be lamb or beef or um, some of the other sectors. Milk, obviously, nearly a quarter of all our milk produced goes into the 26 counties for 
um, processing. So anything that puts barriers to that um, all island trade, that restricts our market opportunity, then that's something that um, has to be taken very seriously. And I can assure you that's something that I take very seriously. Call Mr. Paul Garvin. Question number three. Mr. Deputy Principal, Deputy Speaker. Gary Milgut, um, Regarding the 2007 to 2014 Rural Development Programme, there are no additional funds to distribute as I am pleased to announce that we have achieved a 100% project spend at a programme level for leader. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of those that have been involved in achieving this great result. This is the first for any leader programme in the North and considering that this was done against the backdrop of um, an economic downturn, it makes it an even bigger achievement. This investment has so far resulted in 839 full-time equivalent jobs being created in rural areas at a time when they are sorely needed. Regarding the new leader element of the 2014 to 2020 um, Rural Development Programme, I announced on the 22nd of October last year what each of the new lag areas was being allocated, and that, that has not changed. Indeed, I've maintained these allocations despite the difficult financial um, climate that we find ourselves in, so there are no additional funds um, available for um, allocation. Well, Mr. Garvin, for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, in relation to the new programme that is coming forward, uh, the criteria that was used in the, and the formula that was used, was there any uh, calculation made for areas of deprivation within that? 100%. I mean, um, the Rural Development Programme is the only show in town for rural communities, so when it came to allocating the funding across each of the lag areas, I was very mindful of the need to tackle deprivation. That's very much a focus for me and my department. So in terms of the categories that we, we looked at, rural population, we looked at levels of deprivation, income deprivation, employment deprivation. So we, we used um, quite a range of um, comparators to be able to make sure that the, the, the funds that we distributed were done on a fair and equitable basis, and I'm content that that's what I've achieved. Call Mr Oliver McMullen. Can I thank the Minister for, for a question? Can I ask the Minister, what does she anticipate the calls for applications will open? Well, obviously, our, our programmes with Europe at this moment in time, we've had um, very positive feedback and we're tidying up some of the elements. We hope, certainly by the end of this month or certainly very early in, in July, to have formal um, approval from European um, Commission. The animation process started, we actually launched it at the Balmoral Show, so we're actively now, um, and that will continue over the summer, so we're actively now working with groups, organisations, businesses who may have um, ideas and want to consider bidding into the show. I think that the, um, given the timescale that we expect to achieve in terms of um, formal sign-off from the Commission, I would um, want to be opening calls, official calls for um, full applications in, in September of this year. Call Ms Clare Stockton. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, will it be within the department's power to decide what guidelines um, they will set to, to ensure that the right people receive the right money, um, or appropriate people receive the right money? One of the beauties of the leader program is that it's a bottom-up approach. So it's the community, um, the community deciding, local elected representatives, along with community representatives, um, deciding how the funding should be distributed. But obviously, it's, it's um, benchmarked against criteria. It's all very open and transparent. All applications are scored. Um, on a scoring mechanism. Um, we actually have been working up all of that detail now, but it will be consistent right across the board. All LAGs will use the same criteria. However, each LAG will have the opportunity to look at what are the priorities for them in their area. And for me, um, very much the, one, one of the advantages that we have is that councils are obviously um, pulling together their new community plan. And I think the fact that um, LAGs will also be pulling together their rural development plan, they, those two things very much dovetail. So I think that we're in a good position. So um, whilst criteria uh, uh, and benchmarking will be the same right across the board, each area may have a different focus just in terms of how they decide to distribute the funding through each measure. Oh, Mr. Tom Elliott. Hey, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I uh, just want to ask the Minister if the appointment process for the new boards uh, on, on the new programme, was it subject to 70, Section 75 assessments? The appointment process was taken forward. It was, it was very important to me that we get a good spread right across the board, and the process was taken forward in conjunction with the, the rural um, community networks. They very much did the, all the work on the ground, going out and um, animating, working with groups, encouraging people to apply. And we've had a fairer balance because um, the previous um, makeup of, um, of the lags wasn't sufficient. There weren't enough women. There weren't enough young people. Um, we've certainly addressed that imbalance, but we still have a way to go. Um, 
the calls were made, um, all the members that came forward then had a vote in terms of um, who actually was appointed. So we do have a better, um, I think we have a better makeup this time round, but um, I think there's still obviously improvements to be made. Call Mr. Leslie Cree. Question four. The relocation programme involves four different moves with Fisheries Division to South Down, Forest Service relocating to Fermanagh, Rivers Agency to Cookstown and the rest of my department headquarters to Ballykelly. I am delighted to be able to report that the first of these relocations has now taken place. The headquarters of my Fisheries Division has been relocated to the Downshire Civic um, Centre in Downpatrick since last Monday, the 8th of June. This represents a major milestone in the relocation programme. In respect of the move to Ballykelly, another key milestone was reached recently when my officials submitted a plan application for the new building to the Causeway Coast and Glens Borough Council on the 30th of April this year. So it's hoped the plan approval will be granted by August, um, so in a few months' time. Work is well underway at the other two relocation projects, with Forest Service expected to be in Ishkeen House in Fermanagh by the end of September, and with Rivers Agency to be in their new accommodation at Lockery by mid-2016. Mr. Cree for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, given that the, the Minister is pushing ahead without a genuine business case in this, and despite the concerns of several senior officials in both her own department and in DFP, she's clearly not worried about value for money, but can she give us an update on cost at this point in time? The costs are, as I have previously outlined, um, we are talking about £30.8 million in capital and 14.3 in resource. And, um, as far as um, concerns from officials in either DFP or in my own department, I can assure you that my department and all my officials are working to what is my policy objective, which I have set out. The programme board has been working consistently over the last number of years. We are working very um, closely with staff to make sure that we make the transition as easily as, as easy as possible. The project for me, and there is an outline business case in place, that is all done. The executive has signed off on this process and the move to, um, to relocate. So, without me rehearsing all the arguments, which I'm very happy to stand here and do around the benefits to, um, to rural areas, the economic knock-on effect in terms of the footfall for the rural areas, the, the build, the, so the construction jobs that creates, all the benefits, a fair distribution of public sector jobs, that's what this is about, and I'm certainly very committed to taking it forward, and I can assure you that my officials are tasked to do that also. Call Mr George Robinson. Mr Pr Principal Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister if... Um, has all, the transfer of all the staff to the proposed new site been completed? The transfer, um, assuming the in relation to fisheries, yes, the fisheries um, move happened last Monday, the 8th of June, and all the staff have moved out. Obviously, there may be a few teething problems just getting everything um, smooth, but um, the office is open, the staff are there in, in the main, but um, obviously just until we make sure everything, I'm sure it'll take a couple of weeks for everything to bed in. Call Mr John Dow. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, may I... Uh, support uh, the decentralisation of uh, public service jobs uh, to Ballykelly and hope that other government departments uh, do likewise and contribute to the decongesting of our motorways. Would the Minister agree with me that, irrespective of its previous use, this is one of the most idyllic, beautiful spots in County Derry overlooking Loch Foyle and in Ishone? Would the Minister agree with me that there should be a master plan? for the remainder of the site so that best use is made of the 900 acres rather than flog it off to the highest bidder. I, mean, I certainly can agree that it's a, it's a beautiful site and um, I look forward to the department headquarters um, obviously being completed there. I think that yeah, the site itself, the site should sell itself in that it is a fantastic location. Um, the fact that we've had, um, because we've become the anchor tenant, OFM, DFM surveys have shown that there is significant interest in the site. So um, the strategy for taking that forward obviously will come down to, to that department and they are very keen to make sure that um, we maximise the benefit for the executive and in turn for um, public service, for the departments, for, for making sure that we can deliver for um, the people that elect us. But I think that um, in terms of, I, I can't foresee or, or I suppose, um, I don't have a crystal ball as to who or, or what businesses or the type of um, industry that would want to move into the site, but nonetheless, there's significant interest, and that is very positive in itself. Call Mr. Sam Gardner. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, question number five. 
Under the cattle identification regulations 2012, keepers must report cattle which are lost or stolen in writing to Dard within seven days of the event being noticed. Information on A, stolen animals, or B, animals reported missing um, is kept on the Department's database, the Animal and Public Health Information System, so on APHIS. APHIS does not differentiate between missing or lost or stolen animals. These two categories are recorded collectively on, um, on APHIS. This information is not kept by constituency. The majority of upper band constituency is in the Armagh Divisional Veterinary Office uh, area, and consequently the number of cattle reported missing or stolen in the Armagh DVO area was um, 497 in the 10-11 year, 342 in the 11-12 year, 389 in the 12-13 year, 629 in the 13-14 year, and 666 in the 14-15 year. That totals um, just over 2,500 over the last five years. The PSNI actively investigates reports of stolen cattle, and I would encourage any keeper who suspects that an animal has been stolen to report it to the PSNI as soon as possible so that full investigation can be carried out. Well, Mr. Gardner, for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the, the Minister thus far? But can the Minister give her assessment of the problem of the illegal meat trade in Northern Ireland, and in particular, what is she doing to clamp down on it in border areas where the problem is especially rife? Well, obviously, I condemn uh, any criminality, particularly in relation to the meat trade, because the implications that um, are felt by the wider agri-food industry if people are involved in this type of criminality, it has a knock-on effect, particularly in terms of consumer confidence. And, there, and even though we have fully traceable, all products that are go through our system are fully traceable, it's a wholesome product, we can stand over it whenever instances such as um, food fraud occur. And this is something that uh, it affects the industry. But food fraud is, is a European, it's a problem right across Europe. It's an issue that we seriously need to tackle. It's an issue that's given a lot of priority at European Commission level. It's an issue that I have given priority to and I want to and will continue to work with, um, particularly the PSNI in this instance, but um, also our, envir our environmental health officers, our people who work in the abattoirs, so our veterinary enforcement team. I think everybody has a role to play to make sure that we drive out um, what is essentially a criminal problem which needs to be um, dealt with because of the impact it does have on the rest of the trade. Call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Principal uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, can I ask if you have had any correspondence with uh, Minister Coveney in light of the suspected BSE breakout in, over the border in Laos? Yes, I have. Um, I've spoken to him on the phone, and my officials are um, regularly engaged just in terms of any updates. But there's nothing. Um, obviously, there was an identification of a classic um, BSE BSA case in County Laos last um, Thursday. And the case was identified through the ongoing surveillance systems that are in place, so it shows that the systems and practices that were in place um, actually um, were working. The, food, the animal was not presented for slaughter, so there was no opportunity for it to enter the food chain. Um, but confirmatory tests are being undertaken, and we've been advised that, that will take up to a week for, to get those results. But the one message that I want to be clear on is that, and to give an assurance, that um, our beef remains a quality product and safe to eat. Um, the, the 26 counties, uh, DAFM, and my department are liaison, liaison um, daily and more than, more than once a day, and, and particularly in relation to this issue. But um, hopefully we'll, we'll have um, confirmed results um, over this week, and that will um, hopefully point out to the fact that it's an isolated case. Call Mr. Declan Boylan. Call Augit. Call Could I ask the Minister? <laughs> <laughs> what? My apologies, what, what, Mr. I, Boylan. My apologies. What action her department has taken to try and reduce the number of uh, stolen cattle? Gormin Mogad, I pray. That was a great merger of two individual MLAs. <laughs> my, um, my department has been involved in a, in a number of joint initiatives with the PSNI, including Farmwatch Scheme and the Crime Stoppers Campaign. The Central Enforcement Team of Veterinary Service works closely with the PSNI, conducting joint inspections and investigations. Dard Veterinary Service Enforcement Branch are involved in ongoing training of PSNI officers in relation to animal identification requirements and associated documentation that's required when livestock are being moved. Our VSEB has also attended on-farm workshops organised by the PSNI to discuss these issues and what officers should look out for at roadside checkpoints. PSNI reports um, cases of stolen livestock to Dard and descriptions of stolen livestock are immediately passed to veterinary staff in meat plants in, um, right across the island. The VAS enforcement, um, Central Enforcement Team works closely with the Special Investigations Unit in the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, sharing intelligence and conducting joint investigations. 
APHIS is, is available um, live in all markets and abattoirs, and if an animal has been reported missing or stolen, or subsequently appears in these premises, it cannot be processed for sale or slaughter without a DARD investigation. Call Mr. David McNary. Six, Principal Deputy Speaker. I remain committed to supporting local research and recognise the importance of this to the agri-food sector's plans for growth. Although the benefits of research projects funded by DART are designed to improve sustainability of the agri-food sector right across the north, I will give particular focus to those which are benefiting the agri-food industry, specifically in your constituency. DART funds um, research through postgraduate studentships, the Industry-Led Research Challenge Fund and the DART-directed AFB research programme. DARD, firstly, DARD is currently funding 26 studentships directly relating to DARD's priority evidence and innovation needs and providing high-level training to underpin the science base here. These are, there, there are currently two of those studentships um, being conducted in aquaculture research in the Strangford area with the two further PhDs to commence in the autumn. Three of these studentships are based jointly at Queen's University Marine Labor Laboratory at Port of Ferry and, and also at AFBI. DARD Research Challenge Fund encourages collaboration between rural enterprises and the research community. Recently, a three-year project to improve the breeding of efficiency of suckler cows has commenced on farm um, right across the north, including beef farms in the Strangford constituency. It's anticipated that a further tranche of the RCF will be launched later in 2015. Through the DARD-directed AFB R&D programme, work has been undertaken to provide estimates of overall carrying capacity for the diverse pot fisheries in Strangford Lock and to determine the susceptibility of the seabed to pot fisheries. AFBEAN has been successful in obtaining funding under Horizon 2020 for a programme on water quality for aquaculture systems and under the European Fisheries Fund to work on the sustainable management of the lobster fishery. Finally, the DARD directed AFB R&D programme is funding a range of projects underpinning competitiveness, animal health and welfare, and sustainable environment across the land-based agri-food sectors in the north. New research programmes are in the final stages of commissioning and will commence later in the year. Call Mr McNary for supplementary. Well, I, I do thank the Minister for a comprehensive response. I wasn't actually expecting that when I asked the question, but in further uh, benefiting Strangford and all farmers, Deputy Principal Speaker, does the Minister welcome the rejection of proposed EU caps on methane emissions and consider this to be a huge relief for the uh, farmers and not least of all the livestock? It's, it's an issue of ongoing discussion and it's an, an issue which um, I actually have scheduled a meeting with my officials and we'll talk to UFU as well just around um, what it means for the local industry. Call Mr Edwin Poots. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, does the Minister accept that it's very difficult uh, to actually have specific research projects uh, to assist the agriculture industry when you continuously cut research? And will she agree to look once again at the, the, the research sector and follow uh, what they're doing in Scotland and the Republic of Ireland and identify greater levels of resource to ensure that there is quality of agricultural research? Well, I think it's fair to say that we have um, quite a significant, and even in the answer that I just um, set out, we have quite a significant body of research that's ongoing. We have quite a significant portfolio with AFBI, um, which was, um, I think, £40 million last year. I'm currently working with AFBI around the research priorities, um, the R&D potential, um, looking at um, R&D and innovation. What are the opportunities that we have to attract additional funding from the EU in particular? When my recent visit to China, actually one of the areas um, the Chinese um, Agriculture and Science Institute are very keen to work with us around um, potential research projects. So I think we need to look towards what other opportunities are there for us. But just to be very clear, um, my officials have been working and I have been working with AFBI around identifying what are the priority industry needs, what, what is the, the path um, forward. We have, um, I have recently um, had sight of their um, strategy for up to 2020 and we're working our way through that with them. I understand that, um, and I think there's a, a bit of misinformation out there in relation to um, AFBI and the challenges, uh, particularly in relation to budget. I understand that a figure of 26% has been quoted as representing the extent to cuts to AFBI. That is not actually the case. On a like-for-like -like basis, when you use the same methodology that's employed um, by my department and across the public sector, the reduction to AFBI's budget is in fact 11.5%. Um, this compares favourably when um, you look at um, what I've tried to find internally within DART itself um, of around about 15, just over 15%. So when you set that against AFB's overall cost base, the reduction equates to only 7.5%. So are there challenges? Yes. Do we need to prioritise the work that we're doing in research, development and innovation? 
Yes, and I'll continue to work with AFPI around their priorities and the areas where we'd be able to look towards um, other funding opportunities for research, development and innovation. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move to topical questions, and I call Mr Gary Middleton. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, in relation to the Department's uh, relocation to Ballykelly, has the Minister had any discussions with the DRD Minister in relation to the transport infrastructure uh, to and from the site? Yes, it's an issue actually which uh, my party colleague raised with me, particularly in relation to um, possible railway halt. And um, I'd be very keen to see that happen, and I think that it would really help open up the entire site, particularly if we have other companies and other um, industry move on to the site. Um, I've discussed it with the DRD Minister. He has highlighted challenges. However, we've got an ongoing conversation just around is there any scope or are there any potential um, opportunities for us to be able to secure um, that method of traffic. Uh, of transport, um, which I think would be very beneficial to the site. Call Mr. Middleton for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for her answer and welcome uh, the fact that there have been discussions in relation to a stop there. And the Minister will be aware that there's quite uh, significant uh, traffic on the roads between Londonderry and the Ballykelly site. And um, can the Minister uh, outline, you know, how far uh, those discussions have? Uh, you know, made their way along and to whether uh, the, she will continue to press uh, the DRD Minister in terms of uh, funding this type of proposal? Yeah, I will continue to, to have conversations. We've had a, a number of conversations at ministerial level but also at official level. Um, my project team that are working very hard to deliver the project in Ballykelly um, have obviously factored into all the considerations, the transport issues, the access road, all those things, and we're working our way through that. Um, we are on target to be on, on site, as, as I've previously set out, and we don't perceive any problems um, in, in relation to that, but obviously transport um, issues and making sure that, there's, that the site's accessible for the staff that actually decide to go there is a key, a key consideration. I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. In, in terms of maximising the potential of uh, red meat export markets, uh, would the Minister perhaps give the House her assessment of how successful she has been? We have, um, well, from my took up office, I have very clearly said that this department is an economic department, which is why I worked with the Deputy Minister and established the Agri-Food Strategy Board, which has now come up very clearly with a vision, a strategy for the industry up into 2020 for all sectors, whether that be beef, lamb, um, the milk, um, poultry, and any, of the, any of, the, of the sectors. So we've been working very hard in relation to, and particularly we've been working very hard with our, our colleagues in Daffam and our colleagues in DEFRA around opening up market opportunities. We've had some success actually with um, beef in South Africa last year or over the last number of months, the early or the end of last year. Um, I'm just recently returned from China where we had another very successful um, round of engagements and we hope to have very positive information, um, feedback on that um, market um, hopefully opening up over the next number of weeks. So there's an ongoing I suppose a collective effort at executive level for both um, the Deputy Minister, myself for the agri-food industry, going out and actually um, taking on and, and working with um, uh, whatever administration it may be in terms of opening up new markets. So yes, we have had success, particularly in relation to beef. Uh, I think that there are, the strategy clearly sets out that we have so many more opportunities which we need to be considering. New Zealand, we're looking towards America, we're looking towards um, so, uh, Asian countries. I think that there, the scope is massive, is really, really there for us to uh, embrace, but we need furnace in the supply chain. We need to assist the industry to be able to grow if we're going to be able to do all of that. Well, Mr Nesbitt, for supplementary. Uh, with regard to red meat specifically, would the Minister accept that uh, the, the export figures would confirm that under her watch the Republic of Ireland has been allowed to pull well ahead in terms of developing new uh, export markets, and ultimately that is to the detriment and disadvantage of local producers? There are a whole load of um, different reasons as to why some markets would open up for the, the market in the 26th and, so, and why they wouldn't open for us. Disease status being one, um, quite a range of, of issues. But we have a very strong um, trade working group, both at official level and then between myself and Minister Coveney around trying to work together in terms of opening uh, market opportunities. I obviously have to work um, with DEFRA in England around um, securing um, access to markets. But I think I've been very productive. These things don't happen overnight. The member like, might like quick, wing, quick, quick wins even, but in terms of opening up new markets, particularly in relation to the Chinese market, that I've just returned from my third um, trip there. That's what you have to do to build relationships. 
with these people if they're going to um, be able to achieve market access. So we have very clear, ambitious um, plans, and I and I um, will see. I think we'll see all that come to fruition over the next number of months as we start to see more and more markets opening up for us. Mr. Campbell is not in his place. I call Mr. John McAllister. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And if I could ask the Minister, she will be aware of her uh, colleague, the Finance Minister's comments around the payments, single farm payments, um, and possibly having to use the Rural Payments Agency uh, to pay those. What discussions has she had with the Rural Payments Agency, and what contingency plan is her department uh, drawing up uh, in light of a possible budgetary crisis? I haven't had any discussions with um, the paying agency because I'm confident that I can make the payments. I'm, uh, 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 principal, principal Deputy Speaker, um, and I should uh, declare an interest as a recipient of single farm payment, but surely the Minister must know that given the very, very difficult financial situations that farmers face, our dairy sector is in, in a real crisis at the moment. Beef uh, is in problems. Sheep are in difficulties as well. Grain is in difficulties. Many, many farmers will be in financial desperation, needing a single farm payment. Surely it would be incumbent upon her to have some contingency plan to make sure that single farm payments are paid on time uh, at, uh, to every farmer this year. See, I don't think it's helpful to scaremonger. I'm not suggesting that the members scaremonger, but farmers have a difficult enough time without being dragged into the middle of um, political, um, in my opinion, I think it was a nonsense statement to say that you couldn't make the single farm payment. We have made um, progress year on year in terms of getting, reaching our targets, getting more people paid in December, and I want to build on that again this year, even though we've come through all the challenges that we have in relation to cap reform. But it's a nonsense to say that single farm payments won't be paid. I don't think it's helpful to the farm industry for to start, um, and as I said, I'm not suggesting that that's what you're doing, but whenever we have these conversations in public, the farmers will start to be um, frightened about what it means for them come December. The payment comes from Europe. We make our application to Europe. We say how much farmers, how, the applications that have come forward, this is the amount of money we need to pay. That money is paid directly to, to Dard, and that money goes out to farmers. There's no ambiguity there. It's very, very clear. The payments will be made, regardless if I'm in office or not. Well, Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. President. Deputy Speaker, the Fishing Industry Task Force reported at the end of last year. We're now six months uh, ahead of things. Can the Minister report on what um, has progress has been made, and is she satisfied with that progress? Yes, I mean, out of the interim report that we received in December, um, all of the recommendations have been acted upon. So I think that's very positive in itself. We've also now um, want to, to look at inshore fisheries. So um, yes, I think it's been a very useful piece of work. I think we need to have that ongoing um, discussion with the fishing industry around their needs, um, uh, what they feel the department needs to do, how can we exploit the opportunities that are there through the um, um, EMFF funding opportunities. So I think the, the task force work has been really, really helpful, but um, I want to continue the conversation even though we have delivered on some of the key asks that the fishing industry have put forward. Mr. McCarthy, for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for her response. But could I ask her if uh, could I refer to recommendation number 11, where she talks about fishing opportunities and future negotiations? And we are shortly coming into, once again, the annual uh, Brussels saga. Can the Minister give us any encouragement that reports uh, coming back will be more progressive this year than previous years? Well, I think we've done well in previous years. We've done well to um, stave off some of the um, ridiculous cuts that have been proposed by the Commission um, in terms of quota. Uh, the, the, the normal procedure, we, we're not in the stage yet where we start to um, build our case because obviously it's, it's December when we go out to Brussels. So come about October time, we, we take a look at the science, what ICs have, have said, the scientists, scientists have said. Then we talk to the industry and we identify our priority. So I decide the priority in conjunction with the industry, but certainly um, as with every other year, we'll go out fighting the corner for the local industry, particularly in relation to quota, which is obviously the key decision at, at December Fisheries Council. Call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Can I ask the Minister what assistance has uh, the Minister's Department given to maintain the mobile phone mask at Glenara Forest Park? Um, I thank the member for, um, for raising that issue um, with me. The, the current leaseholder, Arkiva, formally notified Forest Service on the 22nd of April. Um, 
last year that they intended to terminate the lease um, for the site at Glenarve from the 31st of October. Since receiving that Forest Service wrote to the current mobile service provider, which is everyone everywhere, inviting them to meet to discuss any of the proposals that they may have to continue the service beyond October 2015, and that would involve them entering into their new legal arrangements directly with Forest Service for the lease of the site. The meeting took place on the 4th of June, at which EE confirmed its interest to continue mobile um, service provision beyond the end of October. So both parties agreed to work towards a new legal arrangement under which EE could lease the site directly from Forest Service. Ultimately, it will be a matter for EE to determine the commercial viability of, of um, doing so, but um, certainly um, discussions were very positive and Forest Service are up, to, um, are up for working in conjunction with EE and um, coming together in terms of a, a new service provision um, agreement. Mr McMullen for a supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for that? And can the Minister tell me, uh, is there any further assistance the Forestry Service can give to, uh, for provision in the time ahead for the community in that area? Yes, I mean, um, just in relation to the, the, the mobile mast issue, um, Forest Service have agreed to forward a draft lease to AE, and um, as soon as that was available from DSO, so they could consider it, together with the valuation information to enable them to complete their business case consideration. So I think that we'll, um, we'll hopefully be able to um, come to a resolution on this issue um, very shortly in the time ahead. But in, in the area in general, obviously, Forest Service um, have been working uh, very carefully with um, the local community, and we've had some very successful um, projects that have been taken forward under the, um, the investment, the tourism initiative, uh, and Forest Service contribution to that. We had the repairs that happened at Glenarf, we have the new camping site. So I think that there's um, quite a, an ongoing body of work between Forest Service and the local community in that area. Well, Mr. Alistair Ross. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The, the Minister may be aware that the Justice Committee recently held a business crime event in which the FSB in particular mentioned the issue of, of rural crime. So can I ask the Minister what work she's engaged with in terms of tackling rural crime and what work with the rural community she's involved with? Yeah, we work in partnership with obviously the PSNA when it comes to crime. They are in the lead. Um, the department gets involved whenever it's in relation to maybe the welfare of animals, so identification of animals. But very much um, for me, tackling rural crime has to be taken forward in a partnership approach. And I regularly engage with um, both the Minister for Justice, but also with the Chief Constable around just the, the PSNA's priorities around tackling crime and particular issues of concern uh, in, in different areas. So um, it's an ongoing um, I think very much joined up approach and I think we've seen very positive improvements actually in the whole working relationship right across um, all of the agencies that are involved in tackling crime. And Mr Ross for supplementary. Thank you. The Minister will be aware that the perception in the rural community is that this issue is, is getting worse. And whilst I, I certainly appreciate the, the Minister saying that the, the relationship is good, not something which can be worked on, can I ask her whether she believes that the existing structures and communication between rural communities and their local police forces and indeed at a higher level is adequate to address the issue and whether there's any improvements that be, could be made uh, to increase confidence in rural communities that this issue is being taken seriously by the police? I mean, I think we're straying into the, the realms of um, policing issues, which aren't um, directly mine, but I do think that there is obviously room for improvement. I mean, we have, in all areas, all um, districts will have um, the, the, the community police on the ground, and it, there's, in some areas you'll have strong relationships and others maybe not so much. So those are issues to be taken up with the local um, police and partnerships. But at, um, at my at ministerial level and in terms of my engagement with um, the Chief Constable, we regularly, have, as I said, have communication just on key issues of interest at that moment in time and key issues for, for rural communities. So I think that, um, as I said, we, we, we certainly have enhanced and um, improved communication right across all the agencies that are involved with PSNIR, obviously, ultimately in the lead in terms of rural crime. Call Mrs Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to say uh, that I was able to ensure that uh, reducing rural crime was a target in the policing plan, so I'm pleased about that. But, Minister, in relation to uh, Loch Ness and the fish stock, in, in particular pollen and Loch Ness eel, can you advise me how your department manages the fish stock and whether or not you have an, uh, any estimation of the numbers and whether there was a decline or not in recent years? Um, the issue that's actually dealt with under decal, it's actually not under the remit of DARD, however with the change next year and the change in departments, um, the, that, that remit will come into DARD and I think that will actually be beneficial for the entire industry in that we have fishing dealt with within one department, the environmental issues dealt with within one department, so I think that there's benefits for that, that I would um, consider that the lock um, will, will be able to avail of. Time is up. Members will take their ease while we change the table.